Ben, welcome along to High Performance. Um, a person who was studying, living their life like a lot of young people do, and I know you started sort of developing apps and doing various business things, but it's creating Gymshark, which, uh, you know, people love to talk about figures. It was announced not too long ago that, you know, the company's valued at over a billion pounds, which made a lot of headlines and things. And I think the reason why so many people want to hear you talk is, is that old phrase, if you see it, you can be it. You know, people want to believe that everything is out there for them and, and why shouldn't they? So we'll get into the ins and outs of your mindset and how you ended up sitting here talking to us today. But we always start every episode of this podcast with the same question. What is high performance? What is high performance to you? I, to be honest, I, I was having to think about this on the, on the train down. Um, I feel like high performance is it's so many different things. It's like a team that's greater than the sum of their parts. It's obviously a group or an individual that exceeds expectations and performs greater than the average. Um, but yeah, for me, it, it's about having a team that is truly greater than the sum of their parts. They are truly cohesive and they're all uh, moving in the same direction. I really like the fact that you're, you're almost the first person, I think, that has taken that and straight away put it on other people, moved it to team rather than an individual answer. But the truth is that this whole thing came from an individual desire that you had to, to be different and, and to go and to go and make an impact. So before we get into where Gymshark are now and all the amazing things that you've got going on at the moment, can you just explain to us where this drive and this desire came from, do you think? As in my desire to grow businesses? Your desire to create them, I suppose, at the very beginning. So I'm not really sure. So my both of my grandparents ran their own business. Um, on my dad's side, they ran like a local taxi company. On my mum's side, uh, my granddad lined furnaces. He still does now. And that's, that's sort of the first sort of job I had was working with him. So I definitely got a work ethic from those guys. My parents as well, incredibly hard working. My mum's mom, worked in the NHS my entire life up until about three weeks ago when she retired. Dad, very, very hard working as well. <clears throat> so I, I definitely got... Uh, you know my work ethic from those guys I think I'm definitely competitive as well so growing up absolutely loved football um, massively into sport um, but I could I don't think I could say that there's one specific place where it all came from so you went off to university and what were yeah. your aspirations from that from that stage Ben so so when I went to university I just if I, so I like take a step back when I did my GCSEs which um, if someone's listening that don't, I don't know if GCSEs is still a thing. Yeah. I think yeah. now it's about 16 years old, isn't it? That, that yeah. you do your GCSEs. So I did my GCSEs, and I, I, I didn't do particularly well at my GCSEs. I was like average in a, I'd say an average grade would be like a D. I think the best. I think I got a B in English. I've got no idea how I did that. Um, and and I just school didn't. It just for whatever reason I didn't identify with school, and I wasn't misbehaved. I wasn't a naughty kid. For whatever reason, it just didn't work for me. And I think looking back now. The reason for that is, going back to that English grade, is because I didn't really try too hard and I wasn't interested in English, but I, good grade, but I got a good grade. There were other things that I was interested in and I didn't get as good a grade. So it just, for me, it didn't make sense. The, the sort of input didn't match the output. 16 years old, got into the gym and absolutely fell in love for so many different reasons. But I would say the main one is because I knew that if I turned up five days a week for a year, then in a year I would be better off than... than sort of previously when I started. Um, fall in love with the gym, then I went into my A-levels and I did very well at my A-levels. I sort of got incredibly good grades that really, really surprised me and I was fortunate enough to get into university. Um, and my parents in particular were so, so proud because no one in my family had been to university before. It was a massive, massive thing for me and I'd worked so incredibly hard to get there. So got into university and I studied, studied business and I... I must admit, I, I didn't love university, but equally I didn't hate it. I was Again, I was just sort of indifferent about the whole thing. And then it was at that point that I then got into Gymshark. Um, the other thing I would say is before that, throughout school, throughout university, throughout A-levels, I was always making things or trying to work out how to make websites or apps and things like that. And, and, and the core of that love for making things, particularly in tech, came from my, my A-level IT class. But what was it about making things that that seemed to ignite that spark in I don't know, to be honest. Um, I just really enjoyed it. And I, the other thing as well was when I was making things, and again, I didn't think about this at the time, so I don't want it to seem like I was some 18-year-old that had a, had a plan. I certainly didn't. I, looking back, I set the bar extremely low. 
So the first website that I made, I made with um, some of my best mates and neighbours, was a website that sold um, number plates for cars, basically. After that, when I was 16, that's when I fell in love with the gym. And I thought, right, let's try and use this newfound ability I learned in my tech class, i.e. websites and building apps, to try and mix that love with fitness. Um, so it was like the, the combination of two passions, basically. It was, I love fitness, I'm falling in love with tech and making things, so how can I combine those? After that, fitness forums, fitness social networks, fitness apps, um, and eventually led to Gymshark. And were they making money for you, those no. apps? No, no, they didn't. And everything was cheap back then, so web domains, I mean, I think they still are, really, if I'm honest, like £3 for a web domain. The... I had to pay for an Apple developer license to be able to develop apps. But I mean, at the time I was working at Pizza Hut, I think it might've been like 40, 50 quid for the developer license. Um, no, they weren't making money. It was purely a passion project. But I, th I think that's the important thing here though, because often what people do is they'll go, right, yeah, have you heard um, Ben Francis on the High Performance Podcast? Yeah, he was great. What do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? What business do you want to run? Like you weren't doing any of this with an outcome goal of I'm going to set up a clothing brand worth over a billion quid. It was, it was basically, what do I enjoy doing? And you focused on your passions. And I think that is a really good lesson and a good message for anyone listening to this, that that is probably the best place to start. Exactly. And like, if I look at the fitness things I did, it's because I wanted involvement in the fitness industry. So if we go back to when I was 16, fitness changed my entire life. It got me good grades at school. It got me into university. You know, my parents are incre incredibly proud of me. The, the positive reinforcement indirectly for me getting into fitness was, was sublime. Um, fortunately enough, about 20 minutes from where I grew up in the Birmingham NEC, every year they would do an event called Body Power, which I loved. I would go every single year with my mates for this opportunity to just be involved in fitness. So I had this moment where I loved fitness. I had this skill to make things, particularly from a tech perspective. I, wanted, I just wanted involvement in fitness. So if that meant me making a fitness social network or forum or um, Gymshark as a clothing website, the bar wasn't, to your point, Jake, billion dollar business, billion quid business or whatever, or revenue. It was, I just want to be involved. And if this gets me involved, I'm happy with that. But what was it about fitness? I mean, that's an intriguing answer that you talk about. I love it. Mm. What, what was it that, that you grew to love about it? I don't know. I think so. Growing up, I loved sport. So, again, massively into football. Um, it was clear that I wasn't good enough to be a professional footballer. And I was very, very skinny as a kid, very, very thin. Definitely got knocked around a little bit. So, going into the gym and building muscle, it gave me self confidence. It gave me direction. It gave me structure. Right. It gave me a lot of things that maybe wouldn't oftentimes come with school, but for whatever reason, I just didn't quite get out of school. So, you. Eventually created Gymshark, right? And it was you and, uh, you and Lewis did this together. When did you realize the power of other people getting information, getting talent, getting knowledge from others to come and add to your plan to create this clothing brand? Um, so it took, it took a few years. So from a front end perspective, the, the brand really started to kick off after, after two years. And I, I think that's important to reference as well because if people are looking to start a business, you, you can't sort of subscribe to short-termism. Like, if you truly love it, if, if I didn't love it or if we didn't love fitness, then after the first year, you'd have gone, you know, let's pack this yeah. in and do something else, something that will essentially pay better. Um, so the first two years were very, very tough. <clears throat> didn't really get much um, sales or anything like that. And then eventually, through lots of different reasons, the brand ended up blowing up. And it was during this period, we would essentially be going around the world, going out, going to these different events, doing different things. And my brother, who decided not to go to university, came in to basically work the back end of the business, package the orders, send them out, and do, do the basic bits. So all of a sudden then, and this is only very slight, but you realize that one additional person in the business can increase productivity massively. Um, we sort of briefly spoke about it before the podcast, but the, the first couple of years, my role in the business was to have a vision and to drag the business there almost by any means necessary and just through passion, through dedication, whatever it is, I had to drag the business there. And that was fine when we weren't surrounded with loads of people because essentially there's not many people to alienate and do you know what I mean? There's not many people to get on board. You can make decisions quickly and you can, you can move. Um, I think that's what a lot of people tend to call the entrepreneurial years. Once we started to get people in the business, I realized that if I continued to act that way, then I would start to alienate people and yeah. 
going back to what high performance is, if you want to create a team that is truly greater than the sum of their parts, then you need to get everyone on board and moving in the right direction. You need to put people in roles that, um, you know, lean into their skill sets. Uh, and that includes myself, by the way. Um, and, you know, you need to be making sure that you can galvanize a team in a certain direction. So after the first couple of years, I really had to learn the hard way. How were you to told pull. by someone this isn't the way to do it? Or were you looking at it thinking, I'm not sure this is really me? Not at that point, no. So the, the, the point where I think I really started to almost get told, as it were, was when Steve came in, who, who's the CEO for that period. Um, he came into the business. And, it, and if I'm honest, he didn't tell me. And that's another thing that I've realized is I've definitely learned by watching. So Steve, for example, is a br he's utterly brilliant with people management, um, finance, operations, logistics, and things like that. Um, there was a guy called Paul that came in who basically acted as the chairman and he was really thinking about, you know, the structure of the business. And I could watch these two guys and realize that they were brilliant at the things I was terrible at. So I could double down and focus on brand, product, marketing, socials, all these sorts of things and sort of allow those guys to work on, on their strengths. So they didn't tell me, as it were, what to do. But when you see someone who's a great people manager do something infinitely better than you can, it's it's fairly obvious. So give us do. an example of of something that you saw then that made you sit up and go, ah, that's that's a brilliant people management. So I, I mean, I still am, but particularly in the early days, I was so emotionally invested in the product that sometimes it would get the better of me, and I would be, I'd essentially be a bit snappy. Something wouldn't be how I would want. Something something wouldn't be exactly how I'd imagined it. And for better or for worse, I'd essentially snapped at people and I would end up alienating people around me. And then what Steve could do is get a, the same result as what I wanted, the product to a place where we wanted it to be, but do it in a way where everyone else also wanted it to be there. So I, I in the early days, just didn't essentially have the skills to be a great people manager. And then when I see Steve do it in a much more efficient and better way than me, then I think, oh, okay, maybe my behavior needs to change here. And at this point, when Steve was coming into the business and you'd been going for a while and you were successful and it had blown up, as you call it, what did you want it to be then? What was your, what, at this point, what was your vision for Gymshark? Because it sounds like you had quite a clear idea. Yeah, so I want it, I did, this is a weird one. So you have like a dream as to where you want it to be. Like the dream has been for a long, long time to be one of the greatest brands in the world. And that's definitely held us in good stead because it's given us a, a sort of a very long-term mindset in the decisions that we make. But equally, because the business is growing so, so, so quickly, it's it's like a, an incredibly chaotic environment. Um, I wish we had more footage and people could really have been there just to experience just how chaotic it was in the early days. So you have a long-term vision and dream, one of the greatest brands in the, on the planet. But then when you rock up at, you know, in the morning at the office and it feels like you spend an entire day just putting fires out, um, it's difficult to sort of balance those so two So what things. were the fires and what was the chaos? Sort of, could you give us a, a day back in that period, what it really felt like to be in the I middle mean, of the Gymshark I, tornado? I mean, I'll give you an example. We, um, probably the, the best example and one of the biggest lessons for me in terms of, in terms of the importance of a strong back, back end of a business was... We had a, a Black Friday period, and, and historically, Gymshark just doesn't really do sales. We'll, we'll do a sale in around the summer and Black Friday. So Black Friday would always be the biggest sale. And pre earlier on in that year, we'd moved web systems, and essentially, we didn't do enough due, dil due diligence because I just thought I knew best. Um, we moved web systems, we did the sale, and the, the website was flooded with traffic, and the website just completely crashed. It crashed, and then it came back, and then people were essentially getting products without paying for it. So they were putting in orders for free. And we're talking thousands and thousands of orders. And then there were other people that were paying for orders and then, and then not getting things sent. So then we had weeks and weeks of apologizing. I wrote, literally hand wrote thousands of notes to people that had essentially been negatively affected by the sale. The entire business stopped. It took us the best part of a year to fully recover from that, from a, essentially a poor week due to not enough operational rigidity in the business. Um, like we had people, there's a guy called Alfred who runs our social media now. He started the week before Black Friday and it took him about a year before he could actually do his job because the whole business stopped and everyone jumped on customer support. Um, like I said, I was doing everything that I needed to do. We had to then reassess all of our operational systems and it was just because I didn't have enough of a, an appreciation for the importance of a strong back end of a business. I was essentially too infatuated with 
the brand and the product and the front end, albeit extremely important things. But, you know, if you haven't got strong foundations, then you can't have, have a strong front end either. And do you reflect on that period now? Because I imagine it's very different now at Gymshark, and we'll get onto that shortly. Like, do you reflect on that period as being exciting? Yeah, it was hugely exciting. So we, we did our first event I mentioned previously. We did a first event after it was about two years into the business, and this was the thing that blew us up. We went from doing £300 a day in revenue to the £30,000 in the first half an hour of the website being live after the show. And like at 20 years old, nothing, nothing prepares so you for that. what happened at that show then that altered your business so drastically? We, we stumbled upon essentially the marketing model that many people use today. So we had a new product that we built specifically for this event that we didn't sell online. Whilst we were at the event, not through design, by the way, just because we weren't back home and we couldn't send out the orders, we turned the website off. So we accidentally created scarcity. <laughs> we grew up watching YouTubers and our, our YouTubers were our heroes. I learned everything in fitness from YouTubers and we asked them to come to the event and they fortunately said yes. So we had the sort of influencers here. We had the scarcity. We had the in real life event. And then we did this thing where, where we, would go, we would go to the event um, and then everyone would come in, buy their stuff, and whoever was left on the event, at the event from the community, from a customer point of view, we said, listen, we're going to head down to Ironworks and get a lift in, which is a gym in Kings Norton. And we said, if you guys want to come, then let's go. So you had the Gymshark staff, you had the community, and you had the athletes finished up um, at the office, or finished up at the event, went to Ironworks to lift and sort of got a Nando's after. And we inadvertently started to create a community. And people were posting all of this online. It was Facebook at the time. And Gymshark started to go viral. So over this weekend, we had scarcity, we had the event, we had um, the influencers, we had the community that was being built, and Gymshark was going viral on social. And that's where that 300 to 30,000 pound moment happened. You're very modest, but I can't imagine that you get that many right decisions just by luck. I go, well, we inadvertently invited everyone to go. You must have, um, you must have understood the power of community to, to have done that, no? To have invited those people to come with you. I don't know. I didn't, it, it just felt right. We, yeah. So this was not a strategic decision. So this an instinct decision. thing? Is it, that what we're It was definitely about, instinct. Yeah. So we, we'd finished the event and it's just a bit weird, right? It's like everyone was there and it was like, we're going to lift. I'm not going to not invite someone else that's around us that, that seems cool. And it just felt like the right thing to do. And even with the, um, you know, the, the YouTubers that we work with, they were our heroes. Like we were blown away at the fact that they responded to us. And then we ended up making friends with them on Skype sort of thing and just chatting to them every night. It, it was... It was, a, it was a combination of intuition and fortune. And, and that's been a common thread throughout the Gymshark story. There has been several times where we've essentially flipped a coin and it could have gone either way, where we've emptied the bank account on a particular investment, where we've bitten off a little bit more than we can chew. Um, there was an, uh, there, in the early days, I remember I managed to get um, a factory to send us product for free on the, an email handshake that I would send them the money because we couldn't afford to buy it in the first place. There's been so many moments where things have gone our way. Now, I think that blended with intuition, and I, I think we have a great appetite for risk as well. I think that really helped. Um, I think those things blended has really helped Gymshark to get where it is today. So the growth has been incredible, Ben. Hmm. But how much time and energy have you invested in the culture that you have at Gymshark? Because... In the news recently, there's been the story of Brewdog and some mm -hmm. of the cultural challenges that their staff have talked about, the toxic culture yeah. behind scenes. And their CEO has come out and said, we've almost grown too fast, yeah. that we've been focused on the brand and the front end and not what's going on in our organisation. So how much time did you spend reflecting on that? Um, so that was led by Steve. So everything I know from a business culture perspective, I learned from Steve. Um, so for the first couple of years, honestly, we just built the business and we loved it and we just didn't think about uh, things like this. But when Steve came in, he really embedded and, and taught me the power of culture. The reason that Steve is so culture-focused is because he worked at places in the past where it went wrong, where it didn't work, where they were doing things for the wrong reason, essentially to push a number for a commercial value rather right. than for the business. So I think Steve saw the other side of things, which is why he was so, and is, is to this day, so pro-culture and making sure that leadership are always accessible. We are incredibly transparent. I mean, 
we sort of joke a little bit. I think I often share more numbers on my YouTube channel than what some businesses share with their, share with their, in, their internal teams. And, and that's been really, really important to us. And that's a combination of Steve's influence, Steve teaching me and the business how important culture is, blended with us approaching a business build in a way that makes sense. So because I've got little to no experience previously, I don't know what it is like in the corporate world. I've had two jobs. I worked for my granddad line in furnaces and I was a delivery driver at Pizza Hut. I, I don't know any, any, any alternative. So um, the combination of those two things has really led us to double down on culture. And it's, it's the first thing we talk about. Why is that openness so important then? Mainly, honestly, because it feels right. It's a bit like if... Steve also told me something. He said, you want to... Almost like when you're in an interview, one, things that you have, one of the things that you have, you have to ask yourself is, would I work for this person? I always think that about Gymshark. I think, would I work for this company if I didn't, you know, if I didn't start it or own, own shares in it? And the answer is 100% yes. I would absolutely love to work at Gymshark for so many different reasons, and culture would be number one. And you have to fill in a few small blanks for me here, but Lewis stepped away from the business yes. a year ago or something, 18 so months Lewis, ago. So Lewis, basically, me and Lewis started the business together. Yeah. We worked literally shoulder to shoulder every single day for the first three years. He then took a step back and was basically a silent shareholder. Yeah. And then last year, so he actually left the day to day of the business after probably about f four or five years ago, then he sold his stake a year ago. And then an American investment firm? General Atlantic. Came in? Yeah. So you've suddenly lost the guy you set the business up with. Mm -hmm. Steve, who sounds like he's brilliant, but he's come with loads of experience from other businesses. He's come in. And then this American investment firm have come in and taken the portion that Lewis had, and it's all, everything's changed a bit. Yeah. How are you then keeping the core, the DNA of Gymshark? Like how are you making your voice heard still amongst all that change? As in me as an individual? I think or both you as an individual, but also how does the business continue to be what the business is with all of this change? So, so first and foremost, when we looked at bringing an investor on, again, going back to culture being the first thing, that's the first thing that we said to every single person when, we walked through, uh, when they walked through the door and we started having these conversations. Um, you know, we wanted to partner with the right person. We were very, very fortunate to have the opportunity to pick between several different brilliant firms, by the way. Like, there was several brilliant, brilliant companies that we had the opportunity to work with. And General Atlantic were the company, particularly the individuals that we work with at General Atlantic, just completely and utterly got the Gymshark brand, got the Gymshark culture. They realized that we're, we're wanting to build the best brand. And it sounds a bit odd to say, given the fact that we've grown so quickly, but fast growth isn't our priority. It's about building a great, great brand, and they really bought into that. Yeah. Um, so that was really, really important from a cultural point of view. And I mean, I don't really think it matters too much, but there were other companies that offered a higher valuation on Gymshark, but we opted not to take the higher valuation because we wanted to focus on the company that we felt really fitted with our values and could help Gymshark grow in the right way. So tell us those values then that, that, so uh, that define the culture. So it's about being, like I said, humble is probably the most important one. And that's really, really important to me because I've seen... I've seen people lose their humility and from that point I think it's it's very much downhill being truly transparent as a business and that's both internally that's externally accessible so I guess from my point of view I'm I like to think I'm quite accessible both to customers um community um young business owners that maybe want you know to see what might be possible in the future the staff like for example, I wouldn't have my own office at Gymshark. I'll perch wherever, um, and that's the same for everyone, regardless of level. Um, so, yeah, those, those things are really, really important to us. And ultimately, the, the, the long-term ambition is to try and do everything we can to build the greatest brand possible, unite the conditioning community, whether you're, you know, an accountant that wants to go to the gym once a week or an elite athlete that, you know, wants to run a, you know, a world record 5K or someone that wants to deadlift you know, silly numbers. We want to help support you on that journey. So tell us how you came up with those values, because I think there's a lot of people that li like would listen to this yeah. that, that would be thinking, okay, so, so how, so how do I identify my own, whether it's for a family or a, or a business? How do we identify it? So we, it was a weird one. It wasn't a case of us creating the values because we were at the time of doing this, we were a successful business that had built a great culture. It was more of a case of uncovering the things that really make Gymshark tick. And it, there was a moment where we sort of, we were chatting to someone in the business who'd recently joined and they, were, and they came to us and they said, 
the level of transparency in this business is like nothing I've ever known. But again, to me, it was completely normal. And then that's where that one came from. Right. Humility is so, so, so important. Whether, whether you're myself in the leadership team, just joined in the business, being a part of Gymshark is a truly special place. But equally, there is an opportunity be to become a little bit less humble. Um, and again, that's something that Steve's really pushed with us. So tell me about this then, because I, cause a lot of people talk about the virtue of humility, mm. but it's often a cliche or a meme. Mm. You know, someone standing in front of a big posh house telling you, yeah. that I'm just like I'm you. I'm humble. Yeah. yeah. Tell me how, like, how you retain humility then. How do you retain humility? I think it, it comes from... So there's a few things that I think, for example, I'm, I'm a firm believer that you can learn something from everyone that you meet. And I'm also a firm believer that every individual has the opportunity to be the best in the world at something. Now, to some people, it's more niche than others. Ronaldo is the best footballer in the world. You know, some people might be the best videographer in the world. Someone might be the best animator in the world. You know, there's varying degrees of how broad your ability to be one of the best in the world is, uh, what, to be a world great is. But I firmly believe that. Steve also pushes empathy a lot. And I think being humble and empathetic are very, uh, actually quite closely aligned. And he always says, don't ask someone how they are, but then don't wait for the answer. Y I think if you truly care about people and you believe that there's inherent value in every single individual, then you'll realize that no matter how successful you are, it, it makes no difference ultimately. And Such I think, I think that's really important. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, you know, they look at big business and think, oh, if I'm gonna set up a big business, it's gonna be really valuable. I better become a bit of a bastard and throw my weight around and be ruthless and just focus on the finances. And you're really talking about you can be successful and have the total antithesis of that in terms of your mindset. Now, I'm in now a position that I wasn't in a few years ago, so I can look at things in a slightly through a slightly different lens and from a different angle as well. And I'm very fortunate to have met some incredibly wildly successful people, like way way more successful than, than myself like it dwarfs any of the any of Jim Shark's success and the really interesting thing that really hit me like a ton of bricks when I first noticed it was those successful people all have the same problems they all have insecurities they all have concerns do you know what I mean just because the business or your career or your life is at a certain point it doesn't mean that all of those things just disappear so I think that that really hit me because I like most maybe thought that when I meet these people like that run these tech firms that are worth billions and billions and billions, tens of billions, sometimes hundreds of billions, I thought that they'd almost have it all figured out. Yeah. And honestly, everyone is winging it. So then that made me feel <laughs> so much better about me winging it and those around me winging it because, you know, I'm, I'm not the only one sort of thing. So, so what are your helps. insecurities then? Because anyone that follows you on Instagram will see you, you know, you work out, you You've obviously in great shape. You've got a brilliant business. You've got a lovely partner. Like it looks great from the outside, but are you saying even you have insecurities and yeah. concerns? And so, like I'm. So the the thing that I've tried to do is I've tried to heap as much responsibility onto myself as possible because that's really helped me both improve myself. It's almost like the more responsibility I burden myself with, the more the stronger I get as an individual. And that's investment in terms of the business, that's investment in terms of my personal relationships. Just accepting responsibility has been so, so important to me. In terms of my insecurities, there's, I mean, there's, there's many, to be honest. I'm, I've really struggled with, with public speaking. Um, I've really struggled with, I had to have some proper media training to even feel comfortable in a situation like this. A few years ago, I'd be properly struggling with this now and I, I'm definitely improving. What would have not been the struggle? Be. Because it, it seems so natural for you just to sit and talk about your life story. What, what would have bothered you? Um, I think I felt, I felt like, I don't know, I'd, I'd overthink things. I'd think, what do I want to say? What don't I want to say? And I, and, I, and I just struggled with that. And there was a few sort of techniques that I learned through the media training, which really helped me. Um, the other thing as well, which I, I, and I've never, never mentioned this to almost anyone sort of publicly, I've definitely got, and I was thinking about this the other day, I've definitely got this thing where I'm, I'm a little bit scared about being someone that could only found a business. And what I mean by that is I don't want to be a founder that can't then run a business. And that's one of the reasons why I think I'm definitely working incredibly hard at being a great operator as well. Um, and equally, I, I mean, I want to be able to, you know, 
really improve those around me, improve the world, improve the community. And that's really important to me as well. So I think I'm concerned that I might not be able to do enough there. But the, the thing that I'm definitely thinking about now at the moment is just being as great an operator as I can um, and doing best my best by the people around me. I think one of the virtues that that you characterise so well is self-awareness. And I think that self-awareness to step away from CEO role originally and bring Steve in yeah. to do that. And then I know you spoke about you're going back into that, having spent a period of time sort of developing the mm -hmm. skills that you felt you lacked. So how do you maintain that sense of self-awareness where people will give you feedback and know that they can be brutally honest or speak with radical candor to you? So... I think that's a few things. So going back to what we spoke about earlier in terms of being humble and transparent uh, and being transparent, I think that certainly helps. So I'll try and feed back to people as much as possible in, in the nicest way possible. And I also think I, I definitely ask for feedback a lot. Now, I'm in a real fortunate position where I'm now surrounded by people that are comfortable giving me feedback. Right. There's, there's a thing that you can do. Um, this, was another, this was almost a bit of an ego death for me, right? A few years ago, when I was sort of just starting on this journey, we did something called 360 feedback, which I, I, I don't yeah, know if yeah. you guys are aware, but for those that aren't, what you do is you, out, you basically list people around you that you work with or you spend a lot of time with. They fill in a questionnaire and like confidentially, you can't see who answered what, and they sort of tick different boxes to describe you. Um, people can add in comments as well. I had this 360 feedback. It must have been like 20 or 30 pages. I had about seven or eight people that all contributed to it. Um, I read through the whole thing and it completely broke my heart. I thought, that's not me. That just doesn't sound like me. Everyone else is wrong. In reality, everyone else is right. I was the problem. Um, so what, what sort I, of feedback did you get, Ben? Give us just a quick example. Abrasive. Um, can be too direct at, honest, uh, at times. Not thoughtful. Right. Um, I mentioned earlier about being sort of too direct in terms of my product feedback. Um, not empathetic enough. These and even when you read it, did you still not believe it? No, I didn't, it? I didn't believe it. And right. this, this is the thing, and this is the thing that really changed it. I took it home and I put it on the side and then I went off, went to the gym, did whatever. Come home from the gym and Robin, who's my fiance now, was just finishing reading it and I was so annoyed that she'd read it and I was like, why are you reading that? That's mine, don't look at it. It's not even right anyway. Anyway, whatever, cool down. An hour later, I said, what did you think of that anyway? And she said, that's the most accurate description of you I've ever seen. And I was like, oh, God. And that was a moment where it almost felt like everything around me just stopped. Time just stopped. And it was almost like an ego death. And I thought, right, I, whatever is in that 360 feedback, I am going to list down. And I, by any means necessary, I'm going to improve that. And that was a, a moment when I had to reinvent myself. And it was a really, really important moment. That. And it's funny because it's the combination of yeah. professional feedback with the validation on the personal side. And I, I do talk a lot about the balance between the two and the importance of having both. But yeah, that see, was a big moment. See, what I love there is that, that like the way you just described how you listed it down and then you thought, I want to do it. You bought, that was a parallel of how you described going to the gym as a 16 year old, mm -hmm. like looking mm -hmm. at how do I lift weights to develop my biceps or whatever yeah. it is. Like, is that mindset consistent then from you as a 16 year old going into yeah. the gym for the first time to you now being C CEO again yeah and the, so the reason that I'm I really believe that and I think it works and it certainly works for me so I, going back into the the chief exec role two years ago Steve sat down with me and he said shockingly enough he said Ben the business is now moving to a point where it needs a new leadership and Ben I think you could be the next CEO so that shocked me. But what that did was it then it gave me something to aim for. So then I sort of left that. We flew home and I sort of thought to myself, wow, so I could be the CEO. Steve thinks I can be the CEO. Maybe I can. However, similar again, I, to be the CEO, I need to do this, 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 and this. So what that did is it, it gave me something to aim for and it gave me a tangible list of things that I needed to improve. I'll give you an example. One of those things was public speaking. Terrible public speaker, horrifically nervous, fumbled my words, I was good in one-on-ones, but not, not as a public speaker. Funnily enough, then, a few weeks later, I was at a random event, and, you know, hello, how are you? Doing the introductions. Hi, I'm Ben. And I met someone, and they said their job is they're a public speaking coach. Now, normally, I would have just, hello, good to meet you, and moved on and gone on with my day. But then all of a sudden, that triggered the list in my head to, for me to get to where I wanted to be as the chief exec. One of those things was public speaking. I said, 
Can I get your details? Can you teach me how to public speak? I need help, basically. And that's why I think it's so powerful because when you've got something to aim for, all of a sudden these opportunities that pop up in daily life then almost illuminate in front of you because of the list that you've got and the, the direction you've, uh, you've put for yourself. Yeah, that's your reticular activating system that's mm. referred to. That it's a what? It's called your reticular activating system. So the way that, that people explain it is that like when you decide you're going to buy a certain car, yeah. you then start noticing that car on the road all the time and yeah. you start seeing it. So what Ben's describing is when you've got a goal or a target, your brain often filters out unnecessary information, but then now it starts to spot the information that's relevant. I mean, it's like I do it now. I've got my, my phone over here. On my phone, I'll have a list of things, either quotes or things that I want to do, so that every day, even if I'm not reading it, when I unlock my phone, I mean, everyone just stares at their phone needlessly throughout the day. I think at least then I'm, you know, something else is, is, um, you know, is, is there and it's going into my head. So what are you working on at the moment then? What am I working on now? Well, I'm, I'm going through this change now where... So in the past, my role has been... It's been characterised as, as founder is essentially what it's been called. And, and what that, that means is I've jumped across the business into different areas. So I've done a chief marketing officer role, a chief brand officer role, chief product, chief tech. I, I've sat in the entirety of the business. But it's been a case of like jump in, get super involved in something you're passionate about, then move out. Now I'm trying to train myself to be a great chief exec and it's just that one step a little bit more removed and it's interesting because I'm trying to balance that with my love for certain elements of the business but also maintaining transparency on a front end perspective um so that's what I'm working on now I'm trying to be the best chief exec possible I'm trying to work out how to communicate strategy in a better way so at the moment for example we'll build a long-term strategy I'll sort of write down in a scruffy way the way that I think it is but then for me to get that into a digestible presentation at the moment is something that I haven't got the skill set to do so I work with others to help me do that so that's something I think I, I would love to get better at and and in the um, spirit of openness and transparency that we've spoken about a lot you know this is quite a nice little exclusive for us that you're talking to us having only just announced your back as the CEO of Gymshark like how are you feeling like are you feeling under pressure to deliver in your own company um Honestly, I'm, I'm the most excited I've ever been. I absolutely love it. Like, so do I feel pressure? Yes. I feel like I'm just quoting Steve at the moment. He always says to me, pressure is a privilege. And he always, always says that. So I, I feel honoured to be able to do the role. Um, I'm proud of the fact that I've gotten myself to a point of, of being able to do it. Because the other thing with Steve is he wouldn't tell me. And the, and the, the, the people around me wouldn't allow me to do this or wouldn't tell me that I could do this if they didn't think I could. They're very, very honest with me. So I'm proud of the fact that I've gotten to this point. Um, and I'm genuinely excited for the future because Gymshark now is at a stage where, I mean, it, it, it's an outdated figure because we're sort of end of June now, aren't we? But last calendar year, we did half a billion dollars in revenue just through our website. And this calendar year, it's growing rapidly again. And, you know, the runway going forward, is, it's, it, it's more and more and more. And I've really got this ambition for Gymshark to be you know, the UK fitness brand. There isn't really a true fitness brand from the UK. In the States, in Canada, in Germany, there's great brands, but not, not from here. So I'm really looking forward to embarking on that journey. And, and yeah, being in that, you know, that next level of, being under that next level of pressure. Because as a founder, you can flit in and you can flit out. I didn't have to turn up on a Wednesday if I didn't want to, whereas as, as a CEO, I have to be present all the time. I have to be making sure I am dedicating time to areas of the business that maybe don't excite me as much as others and give them the same passion and determination as I do the things I love. See, well, can I ask you a question then that I think a lot of people will be listening for of like, why do you want that pressure? Why do you want to do things that don't excite you or stretch your comfort zone when it would, have, it would be feasible for you to walk away and you don't have to work again for the rest of your life. You can mm -hmm. go and enjoy exotic holidays. You can go and travel. You can do anything your heart desires. So why are you choosing to put yourself into this position? I, honestly, I just love it. I, I, love, I love the vision. I've, I've, I've met people throughout, you know, in pre-COVID times when we were travel. I've met people that have told me about how much the brand has inspired them, how much the story has inspired them, how much the brand has, you know, people have started businesses based on the brand. People have lost masses of weight because of the brand. People have completely revolutionized their mental health because of the brand. People have built muscle because of the brand. And that makes me so incredibly proud. That combined with the fact that I get to work with some of the best people in the world. Like, 
I'm in a situation where if I want to learn about data, one of the best people in the world is our chief data officer. If I want to learn about product, our chief product officer is, again, one of the best in the world. It's like having the dream job. If you want to improve, I can do it like on a turbocharged basis because I have the best people around me. Normally what you do, and it's brilliant that, you know, you guys are doing this podcast and you've got things like YouTube because it gives, you know, people that maybe aren't in my position access to great minds. Whereas I've almost got the level above that where I can literally sit one-on-one with great minds and learn from them. And I absolutely love that. And it is going back to the thing I mentioned previously is, and, and, you know, this has been talked a lot about online, is responsibility does give meaning in life. I truly believe that. So do you think that... You, so, again, an obvious question that a lot of people would ask is that does great wealth or great success make you happier? Hmm. How would you answer that? Um, I, don't, I feel like I've always been quite happy. So I was... There are times... I, I, I must admit, right, there are times when... I do think about like I'd finish at Pizza Hut, I'd get the free pizza at the end of the end at the end of the shift, and I and then I go to the gym with my mates. Like that was such a carefree, incredible time, and I absolutely love that. Um, but equally, I live an amazing life now, and I, I love that now. So I would say to a point, yes, because I've also been able to do things that make me incredibly proud. So I've been able to look after my parents, my grandparents, uh, you know, my my wider family. I um. I was recently announced, which was pro- a proper moment for me and my family. I was announced as patron of Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital. Mm-hmm. And having watched my mom, I mean, she works at, in the NHS in Selly Oak, or she worked in the NHS in Selly Oak. Having watched her, she would um, work all night, come home, drop me off at school, sleep all day, and then pick me up after, after school. So to be able to give my bit back to the NHS um, is really important to me. So it's putting me in a position where I can look after those around me, I get the opportunity to focus on things that are important to me, such as the, the patronage of uh, Birmingham Women's and Children's. Um, and equally, money does just give you choice. Like, it doesn't make you a better person. I think there's a level where it does make you happy, but it just gives you choice, ultimately. I really believe that. It can also make you a worse person. I mean, what's the current valuation of Gymshock? What's the, what's the general feeling? I've, More than a billion. Yeah. And you have, what, 50%? To uh, set just over 70. Right. So if we, you know, rough mass would make you worth 700 million pounds, right? If that's just plucking a figure out the air. That's the sort of money that, that can completely transform, transform someone's mindset. And not for the good, but for the worse, actually. How careful have you had to be to make sure that that, that doesn't happen? Or has that come easy for you? So very, there's, there's a saying I've heard as well a, a few years back. If, if you give a half crazy person money, then they go full crazy pretty quick. Um, <laughs> that's something that's definitely reigned true. And I, 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 have, I have an incredible fiance, right? She keeps me so, so, so grounded. She calls me out. Like I've got an amazing family. I've got brilliant people around me who, who I think if I did ever start to stray, they would they would call me out. I think I'm at the point now where I'm mature enough and have lived with this long enough, enough now to know how to deal with it. Like, being candid, from the age of 2021, 20, we have had offers for the business that would allow me to retire and completely change my life and almost live happily ever after. So I've been, I've, you know, I've, been in, I've had this for a long, long time now. It's not anything that's new. In the, in the recent... Um, in the recent deal with Gemini Atlantic, I actually took the opportunity to increase my shareholding because I really believed in the business that much. Um, my, my passion for the business and the cause severely outweighs my desire you know, for, for personal finance. And again, that's not to say that I don't enjoy that. I absolutely do. It's a massive, massive privilege. Um, but equally, it's not, it's not the be all and end all. And there's so much in this conversation to be impressed by. I mean, I think for me, one of the real big things that people might not have known is that you took this step back and you went into all the areas of the business to improve yourself. So self-improvement is constantly there, but so is your like relentless energy and drive and desire. How much time do you spend taking a step back, sitting quietly with a smile on your face thinking, bloody hell boy, you you did okay actually. Um, Probably not enough. So it's, it's more in those quiet moments, which happen less and less now because of COVID. So I would, I, I mean, the, the year I met my other half, which was five or six years ago now, we did, we did 52 flights that year. 
Um, after that, it was like 30, 40 flights. Like we, we travel a lot. And it's in that moment when you're sat on a plane and there is nothing else to do. You can't go on your phone. That's when it sort of hits me. It's even coming down here on the train today, sat on your own. It does, you do think about it a little bit then. Even sometimes turning up to Gymshark HQ, which is also expanding rapidly, walking up and seeing that logo is, is really cool. Because it is, you know, it, it's, um, it's changed a lot of lives. And the logo does hold, uh, you know, a, a great place in people's hearts now, which is, is incredibly humbling. So one of our great questions that we like asking, Ben, is mm. um, an idea from the management writer, Jim Collins, where he right. talks about having a to-stop list, a, a to-don't list. Now, oh, you're somebody that has got a whole heap of different demands on your time and yep. your energy. What are the things that you don't do that you just resolutely refuse to that, take on? That I don't do or I want to stop doing? Either. One of the things I want to stop doing is saying, erm. Um. I feel like I erm um, a lot. <laughs> I need to get better at speaking and I need to... I've seen great people do it. Like, if you ask them a question and they don't know what the answer is, they'll almost take a step back and think and that's something that I want to do. I'm too ermy at the moment. Um, there we go. What else? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a nightmare. Um, what else do I want to stop? I don't know, to be honest. I really don't know. I need to have a think about that. So you don't say yes too often? I think I do, yeah. I'm, I'm very open with my time, but it's, I think, so this is the balance of accessibility is really important to me and Gymshark. So whether, I mean, like, I've been very, very busy this week, but then there was a, um, a really cool young business owner from, from Manchester who really wanted to have a look around the office and see the headquarters and almost get in inspiration. And I said yes to it and I loved every second, second of it and it was definitely the right thing to do. But there's only s so much of that you can do, so I have to protect my time. So I think I could probably get better at protecting my time. And if I'm honest, it's something I'm just not very good at. So that's something that, will, that is essentially being outsourced um, to someone else. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Because the reason I ask is that I, that I think, again, it goes back to that decision that you made to step down as CEO originally mm. before I know you've come back into it. But I just thought there was a real courage in that of recognising I need to stop doing this and mm. let somebody else take it on. And that's why I was wondering how you apply that same principle elsewhere in your life. I think, it's a, I think I, you sort of have to pick your battles, right? There's certain things that I will want to have a go at and, get, and improve on. And then there's certain things that I will essentially just, I'm not going to get to that. Someone else needs to do it and I'll give it a go in my spare time to try and improve. Yeah. Do you know about survivorship bias? Which basically means people that have done really well love telling everyone how they've done really well and they don't see all the people that didn't quite make it and they just assume everyone, everyone can do it. Now, sometimes we get an accusation on these podcasts that, oh yeah, you're, you're talking to people who've been really successful, therefore they have survivorship bias. I always say that people that don't listen to this podcast because they don't hear the fact that 80% of our conversation is actually with people like you about the failures and the struggles and, and the difficult times. But I think there is, there is only a benefit to getting someone like you to come on here and share your story and share your journey and, and the way that you've done it for other people that dream of doing the same thing. And I, before we walked out here and sat down, I said, oh yeah, you know, I, I just think it's great for people to hear this because... They, they would probably hope that they can do the same thing. And your immediate answer was, well, they can. I think that's a really good message before we move into our quick fire final few questions. A really good message to leave people on is that you still have this belief that anyone listening to this podcast, regardless of where they're from, their background, that they can do this. They can make a yeah. success of their life. And, and now more than ever, because if you look at online, it's growing massively right. And the, when have we ever lived... We haven't lived in a period where a niche can be so powerful. Like, there are kids that are really good at FIFA that have full businesses and channels and social platforms and all sorts that are doing incredible things in the world. That was never, never possible before. So what, what the internet has done is allowed people that have a niche interest to truly turn that into a career. And I think that's really important. And, and now, even, even more than that, we're now coming out of the COVID pandemic if you look at many of the greatest businesses in the world, they were all started in and around a period of chaos. And now as we leave chaos, I think there is genuinely an opportunity to create special businesses to, you know, it's an opportunity for you to double down on what you're truly passionate about. And I, and I think that's really important. I think the more people that see this as an opportunity, um, I think the better. Brilliant. It's a very good mindset to have. Um, talking of mindsets, 
what are your three non-negotiables Ooh. that you and the people around you have to buy into, Ben? So the people around me, I want, I want people around me that are open-minded, that are focusing on self-development and, and are humble. Very good. What's the one piece of advice you'd give to a teenage Ben just starting out? The, the thing that's really stood me in good stead is trusting my gut. And I don't have many regrets, but the regrets that I do have are when I haven't trusted my gut. And I'm a firm, firm believer in that. So I would say, trust your gut. I would say, really take time to understand who you are and what you want. Um, and learn something from everyone that you meet. Very nice. What's your greatest strength and what is your biggest weakness? I think my, I, th- I do think my greatest strength is, is, I think it's a combination. I think it's self-awareness. And I've definitely got an ability to, to learn things quickly and almost apply them. So I've been able to reinvent myself several times throughout my, my life. So I'd say that's, that's probably my biggest strength. My biggest weakness. I would say... I, oh, God, I've just got so many weaknesses. I'm not... So I'm not naturally attuned to... Like public speaking, working with teams, even some things when it comes to numbers, they're naturally really, they're terrible for me. Like I'm literally paving over the cracks to be any good at them. Um, And I do often get almost envious of people that are naturally brilliant at it. So yeah, my weakness actually is, funnily enough, I I don't think I'm naturally built for that sort of thing, but I think it's something I I will hopefully improve at. What's one book recommendation you'd offer our listeners? So I'm not a massive, massive reader. there's a few books that have been really important to me um, and have sort of changed things. There's one, which is going to sound really boring, um, but it's probably the one that, that impacted me the mo- most. And it's a, it was a book called, um, a guy called Charlie Munger, and it's called Poor Charlie's Almanac. Yep. And it's basically a book that I'm pretty sure it's all of the talks he's ever done, talks and things that he's written, basically brought into one book. He works with Warren Buffett, is yeah, that yeah, right? Exactly yeah, exactly that. And, and, and the, reason, the reason that that really impacted me was because I went into it thinking, this guy's an investor, he's a financier, we will have nothing in common. And interestingly enough, he really is a brand-focused person and he breaks things down and approaches problems in such a brilliant way. Um, he's almost got this mental toolkit or Swiss army knife in terms of how to, how to solve problems. And, and that really fascinated me because I think you, you don't want to always try and solve problems in the same way. There's a, there's a quote he uses in it where he says... Um, to a man with a ha- to the man with a hammer, every problem looks pretty much like a nail, and I always remind myself of that because I think everyone has their go-to way of solving problems, and I think it's sometimes interesting to try and solve problems in different ways or look at things in from a different angle. And he really opened up my mind to that way of thinking. It's great. And the final question from us, um, kind of your last message for people, really, which is your your one golden rule or your one message for people to live a high performance life. It has to be self development. Develop, understand who you are, understand where you want to be and put in daily steps to get yourself there. Ben, that's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. Thank you. Real privilege. Thank you, Ben. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.